Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 42, we're going to talk about mixing vintage and modern tubes. Now, I'm going to use the Wilsonton R8 as an example amp and, and the set of tubes for it. Now, don't roll your eyes. This is not just a video about the Wilsonton. I've done enough of those. This is primarily about how you can improve your sound or make some compromises. Let's say, let's say you can't afford a, a, a high quality, you know, vintage quad of KT88s, because let's face it, they're very, very expensive. So, but you want some of the smoothness of vintage tubes. So you would put a vintage front end with a more modern power tube. Neat, huh? Okay, but first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when, when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. This week's video happened because I was trying various power tubes in the Wilsonton R8 amp, looking for something that was commonly available, affordable, and sounded good. None of my alternative tubes was exciting me. Then I looked up and realized I had a couple of nice match quads of reissue Genelex Gold Lion KT88s sitting on top of my parked Klipsch speakers. So the tube rolling began in earnest, and this is the result a melding of a vintage front end with a modern power tube. Let's take a quick look at these modern KT88s. Now these are made by New Sensor of New York in the old reflector factory in Saratov, Russia. Um, reflector makes good quality, solid tubes, but many of them are kind of eh, you know, there, there's nothing special about them. There's nothing bad about most of them, though I have had some problems with the the Mullard reissue EO34. I had a bunch come in. I think I've talked about those in the past. Anyways, um, they that that run, whatever was wrong with them, they were not good tubes. Um, I think I had one died in transit, one died on the tester, and they just didn't sound very good. So, But maybe that was just those particular tubes. Um, you know, factories do have good months and bad months. I remember back in the day, my dad said, whatever we do when we buy the next car, we're not, we're not buying a car made on a Monday. <laughs> that was a thing back then. Everybody figured that, uh, half the guys on the factory floor were hung over on a Monday morning. And I bet you in the tube factories in Russia, that was a big thing too, or, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, especially the week after New Year's, but uh, anyways, uh, let's get up close. Nice labeling. Um, the Gold Line brand uh, was Genelex back in the day. Genelex um, wasn't a tube manufacturer. I believe they were based in the UK. Um, let's see if I could. I'll get as much of the details from memory as I can. I didn't do the research. Uh, what they did was they bought the very best tubes they could find around the world. They didn't necessarily buy just from one manufacturer. And then they rebranded, and they became actually quite famous for high-quality tubes. Somebody can jump into the comment section if I didn't get the history right. It's not really important to today's video. So, look at the structure on this thing. Lots of support rods. In fact, there's six support rods. The plate wraps around these rods in a really nice way as it goes around. And look at this at the end here. You see that folded out piece of metal? It goes right in between the two plate, the gray plates. It gets welded on. That's a good sign of a quality plate. Some riveted power tubes can sound pretty good, but in my opinion, the riveted tube is almost always a superior tube. I mean, the classic of this is the XF2 Mullards from the 1960s. The next two generations, the XF3 and 4, went over to a riveted plate design. And ee. anyways, I think that that's either structural reinforcement, but look how it looks like a fin. I have a feeling that that actually is to help dissipate heat. And we've got a side getter, as you can see with the side chrome. And we've got an upper mica. All in all, we've got a really 
good sturdy power tube. Now remember, KT88s are high power tubes, so they get hot, like very hot, and they stay hot a long time after you turn off the amp. And don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> Anyways, um, this this envelope is designed to allow this thing to heat up quite hot. And of course, as all this metal here heats up, it expands. And you can't have a tube bouncing around inside the envelope. It has to fit snugly, stand up sturdily on its base. And I think they've done this quite well. I've, I've, I've had these in all week testing them, and they're dead quiet. I can't get them to ring or make any noise. Nice solid tubes. And the bias sets solid. So on the Wilsonton, we have a really easy way um, to set the fixed bias. And I use that as one of my methods of monitoring power tubes, particularly expensive vintage quads, to see if they're healthy. And if the bias can be set, allowed to warm up, let's say another hour, and then adjust it slightly to get it bang on, and if it stays put, that's a good sign that the tube is healthy. If it's wandering around a little tiny bit, that's acceptable. If it wanders around a lot, i.e. the bias won't stay, it won't stay fixed, um, then that's a sign that you've got a problem with the tube. Okay, so that's that's the modern power tube. What do we put in the front end? Well, I went with the Sylvania 6SL7 GT. This is a tube from the 1950s. It's in my top three or four 6SL7s. It's a wonderful sounding tube. You get that rich um, mid-range of, of the, that's typical of a number of tubes from the 1950s. The Sylvania and the Meltz tubes are very similar tubes in that way. In fact, one of the most famous tubes from that era is the Sylvania 6SN7 um, GT, otherwise known as the Bad Boys, and um, it it's actually very similar. It's got it's got its getter is down here. It's a foil getter. It's got a big piece of waste chrome like this. Uh, different plate structure, of course, and um, and it also has a wonderful rich um, mid range. With um, with fantastic, fantastic bass, and I'm not talking thumping bass. I'm talking about nice, detailed, rich, slightly forward sounding bass. Anyways, we're we're getting off topic. So this is a great tube. If we want to bring some of that, um, some of the qualities, some of the best qualities of a vintage 6SL7 to an amp um, like the Wilsonton. This is, this is the preamp tube, it's in the voltage gain slot, so it has the most opportunity to influence the sound. And that'll be the same for any amp. That, after that, we've got the phase inverter um, driver stage, and for that I just I put a rock-solid vintage tube, the GE6SN7GTB in place. The GTA is almost the same identical tube, just separated by a generation of manufacturing, perhaps a decade. And let's just take a look at some listening notes and see what I came up with. Oh yeah, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, about the big problem with the KT88 type. The mid-range can sound a wee bit flat compared to the EL34 type, which is what we're up to right here. However, the KT88 type excels at bass, punch, and shear power compared to the EL34. So, what we're trying to achieve is some of that richness um, of the 1950s tubes. Well, these GTBs are from the, probably from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, but these are from the 1950s. And, um, and we're trying to mix it with an affordable, reliable, modern KT-88. And let's see what we got. I used to actually summarize the listening notes, but I think it's more instructive to, to just read off of them. So we kept everything static. The only tube I was rolling around was the 6SN7, because I already knew that I'd be happy with the Sylvania 6SL7. 
And of course, the power tube stayed the same. It was the General X KT88. But I wasn't sure about the GTB slot, so I started with the G, and I, I, I put it in because this package is not meant to be the ultimate, most expensive KT80 package. It's meant to be something that's a little more affordable, but gives us some of that, that good sound of the 1950s, of the vintage tubes. So bass with the G was, was very good. A nice tone and detail, slightly forward. We'll get back to that in a minute. Mid-range was good. The three C's. Crisp, clean, and clear. Nice, rich tone. Note that. Nice, rich tone. Treble, three C's. It was good plus. All the tubes were low in microphonics. They're all nice and quiet. Now, I thought I could do better, so I rolled in some Tungsol 6SN7 GTBs. And what I found was the bass was neutral. Now that that could be great in some applications, but in this case, I think the KT88 type and people who are using it want the bass to be a little bit out there, just a little bit forward. So that didn't work. Mid-range is about the same. Same goes for treble. I also rolled in the Sylvania 6SN7 GTB. And it was basically the same as the Tung Sol. They're very similar tubes. They're, they're both wonderful tubes. But they won't be the best in every application, right? That's why we roll tubes. So the bass was very slightly forward, which is common of the early Sylvania tubes, both the 6S N7s and the 6S L7s. And the mid-range and treble were all basically the same. So what did my conclusion come up with? Well, I said all tubes had a nice sound stage and good detail. Now, you notice I put the detail back before this, and the reason for that is you don't get a nice sound stage if you can't get good detail. That comes first. And of course, a big part of sound stage is the rec who recorded it, you know, how well it was recorded. Your speaker placement by far is the most important. But if if our amp isn't feeding the sound stage clearly, with good detail, then it doesn't matter you know, how good our speaker placement is and how good the recording was, we don't get anything, right? We, we muck it all up. Everything matters. Okay, all made for a good combo of vintage front end and modern power tubes. But I like the G the best. It brought the bass forward nicely and it was a good pairing with the gold lines. And that's what we're talking about. Let me put that away. When we're trying to blend or meld or mix 1950s to 2000s, <laughs> we're talking about tubes uh, that are multi-generational apart. And the materials used in these vintage tubes probably, some of them are just not commonly used anymore. And I think a big part of why there's so much richness and magic in the 1950s into the 60s is that we, we didn't have a lot of environmental controls in that period during for manufacturers. And we were using all kinds of really um, dangerous and strange uh, metal combinations, coatings, and uh, even though I have a feeling modern manufacturing processes probably have improved, the, uh, the actual secret formulas that manufacturers like Sylvania and Mullard used in the 1950s, I think a lot of those either aren't used because they're not practical today, um, or they're just so expensive people don't want to use them in the, in the, you know, in the manufacturing. Who knows? It's a mystery. A lot of people like to talk about that. And basically, I'm just blowing it, right? Because I don't know the answer. All I know is the sound result. <laughs> okay. So I put a couple of these packages together under the Wilson tube package marked as Special Vintage Plus Modern, just in case anybody's interested. Now, let's just clear the decks because a lot of... Um, in-demand tubes came in this week. It's been an incredibly busy week. A lot of tubes came in, hundreds and hundreds of tubes, and a lot of orders have to go out. So busy, <laughs> busy like a beaver, as we say in Canada. 
Um, oh yeah, here I wanted to show you this. Let's get these up. Okay, so this is a good testing 6550. It's GM is way up there at 120. So 100% is the nominal noodle stock. Milliamps is at 49, which is way up there with uh, a brand new tube. But look at the top. You see the clear dome? The getters are on top, so where's the silvering? Well, the silvering is gone completely. Now, it's normal in a tube that is uh, 10, 20, well, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year old tubes. It's normal for the gettering to wear back a little bit. Let me show you what a more normal amount of gettering is. You see that? So it may have worn back slightly. These aren't that old, these tubes. They're about 20 years old, I think. I'd have to look at the dates, but roughly, let's say they're a couple of decades. So what's happened here is that the vacuum is going. This is, even though this tube tests well, and it sounds good in the system, it's about gone. And it's not safe to be running tubes with the vacuum going because this tube is going to die in a hurry all of a sudden and it's going to be exciting. So in the bin that goes. Okay, so what came in this week? Well, quite a few 6550 Svets. And this is, this is one of my favorite KT88 types. It's just a, a lovely vintage tube. And... A lot of customers have bought them. So, believe it or not, uh, and it's a tube I'm having a hard time keeping enough quads in stock to meet demand. So, believe it or not, I'm up to eight pairs. <laughs> I have eight close matched pairs and no quads. Uh, but there are some more tubes coming in. I was lucky enough to find, I actually found um, a couple with a, a Russian wholesaler. And I always take the time to send a little note. And I said, I'd like those two, but would you have any more? And he sent back a note and he said, yeah, there's, there's, there's a, a bunch more. Let me make a listing for you. So they're, they're coming in and hopefully they'll turn some of these pairs into quads sometime in the next week or two. Okay, and they're all testing really good, which is nice to see. In fact, sign of a good vintage tube is the majority of the use tubes coming in test good and of course sound good but if you've got lots of tubes in the mix testing bad then that's a good indicator you don't have a quality tube period modern or vintage it's a really good indicator and i also found some of these svetlana kt88 and i gotta be honest with you i've never had them in i didn't even know svetlana made them so um and it makes sense because basically the KT88 is a higher powered version of the 6550. In fact, let me go grab those. You can see that there's some differences. There's some big support rods on the KT88 type, but the, they're very similar tubes. The bottles are the same and um, the plate structures are very much similar. Anyways, a bunch of these came in, and wouldn't you know it, I've got only pairs. So, <laughs> if anybody is running um, uh, KT88 single-ended amps, then I I'm your guy. <laughs> Anyways, I'll keep an eye out for some more. Eventually, we'll get some quads. A huge pile of these um, power tubes, which go in the monoblock, came in. These are all dated 1975. It was... Um, it was probably substantially two case lots that that's how many tubes came in I actually had to get my wife to help me unwrap there were so many tubes to unwrap but what this allows me to do for um, the little single-ended um, a tube amp kit that that's going to come out in the fall is to have enough stock that I can get very close matched power tubes you only need a pair right it's it's, it's two monoblocks, they're single-ended, so you only have one, in this case, you only have one power tube on each channel. But it's because it's single-ended and it's, um, it's auto-biased, so you, you, you want to have your tubes nice and close match when you plug them in. Otherwise, you're going to have some imbalances in the stereo image, the sound stage. You know, with a good selection, that won't be a problem. Okay, what else came in? Oh yeah, same amp, the monoblock, uses 
this wonderful um, radar version of the 6J5 with the two sexy top caps and I found a whole pile of Svetlanas. Everybody who watches my channel knows that Svetlana, in my opinion, made some of the best Russian tubes or best tubes in the world, period. Look at the plate on that. Isn't that gorgeous? Two nice support rods. It's got a, a silver interior portion of the plate that extends up outside the casing. You can see a little silvering at the top and bottom. And the best of all, these all date from the 1950s. Uh, and the, the only ones that I have in stock right now are from the 70s, and they sound amazing. So I can't wait to hear the 1950s version. And because parts are coming in by the hundreds for the kits, um, this is actually just a little bag that I keep at my um, at my lab bench, so that I have some handy. I love these ceramic top caps. Back in the day, a lot of them were made out of Bakelite and you know some versions of plastic and things like that. Ceramic though, there's something just really clean, and I think they're just pretty looking. Um, and these are decent quality. I I really been you know, having a good time soldering them in there. Now that I figured out how, how to solder them without, with a, you need a third hand to solder these things. That's a tricky thing. And when I make my build videos for, for the, uh, for the amp kit, I'll show you how to do that. I, I, it took me three, I had to burn myself three times to figure out how to do it properly. But anyways, the, that's what I do for you folks. <laughs> and I saved the best to last. This is, I believe, a World War II vintage 7193 tube. It is the same tube as this, so it's the driver stage of the little mono blocks. The this radar tube was so important during the Second World War. Everybody in the Western countries um, who um, wanted radar, and they all wanted radar. Let's face it, um, had their own manufacturers build their own types of tubes, all to the same basic specification. They're all very, very similar spec-wise, but they all got their own numbers. The British used the DET-20 CV-6 number. Uh, the Russians used the uh, 6C-8C. The Americans used uh, 7193. Now, I'm not certain if this is from 1942, but there's some good indicators that it is. National Union Radio Corp, that was the original name for National Union, and I've never seen the full name spelled out on a box before. They started a wartime plant um, just outside of Philadelphia, I think, in um, Lansdowne, I think it's called. And, um, and that plant, I believe, was bought out by Sylvania and became a Sylvania plant in the early 50s. And then eventually uh, Ford took it over. And there, if I've got my history right, Ford uh, uses it now for their electronics division. It's uh, for research and development. Anyways, this was a wartime plant. It was built in 1942. And look at the order number on here. The last digits are 42. U.S. Army Signal Corps. So I suspect 42. That's the indicators. Um, and look at the gorgeous box. I've never seen one just like this. And it, So this is probably... Um, it's probably a National Union design. Now, the National Union didn't design tubes. They actually licensed all of the tubes they made, I believe, from RCA. So the tube we're going to look at is an RCA design. Now, this box hasn't been opened since 1942, probably, right? So that's 69 years. So it's amazing it's in such good shape. It obviously was stored dry. Look how it comes out. Isn't that... Why aren't all tubes nestled like that, for God's sake? It's just perfect. But of course, this was meant to go to war. It had to go across the Atlantic in many cases, or the Pacific. And, um, you know, it was subjected to fighting. <laughs> had to go in the field, you know. Um, so let's have a quick look at it. This is how a new old stock tube will look. You see how it's flecked with dirt? See how dirty it is on the bottom? It's been sitting in storage in a dry store, obviously, but um, little tiny bugs get into the cardboard and they munch away. And uh, luckily everything is sealed. 
So, you know, you're not going to have any bugs inside your glass, thank goodness. But look, take a look at this. Isn't that beautiful? It's just absolutely perfect. I love the way National Union did their lightning bolts. They did a really good job of labeling the tube. And of course, it's, it's literally a brand new tube that's, you know, decades, decades old. How did they sound? Well, in the monoblocks, this thing blew me away. I couldn't believe how good they sound. Now, I've got the Svets in there, and they sound great. I've got um, a really interesting uh, Second War uh, vintage Mullard in there, and they, they sound great, and these sound fantastic. Anyways, that was fun. Um, if you stayed till the end, I've got some discount codes for you. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. We now have in the store the option to tick um, a box and pay, uh, depending on where you are, pay a fee for tracking. Tracking is a big deal coming out of where I ship from. Um, in some cases, it, it doesn't cost me anything. If I ship within Canada, um, I pay more for shipping across the board. To, I pay more to ship in Canada than I do in the U.S., believe it or not. But I automatically get tracking in Canada included. In the U.S., I have to pay a premium. And some countries, you know, Europe, it's sort of affordable to pay for tracking as an extra charge. But in some countries, you may may actually say you'd like to track a parcel. But I'm going to send you back a note and say, look, you know, it's $60 to track. So <laughs> I'm sorry, it can't be done. <laughs> I don't know what they do. Do they put somebody on the plane with the parcel following it? <laughs> Anyways, and if your order is $150 or more after discount, shipping's free. It's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vals and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.